Hello and welcome to another episode of Market Watch. We at Market Watch attempt to bring unique perspectives to our investors, and today we would like to bring uh, and rekindle the interest in an industry which received significant attention in the early 2000s in Sri Lanka, the oil and gas industry. Uh, as an industry, the oil and gas industry has significant uh, implications to Sri Lanka considering uh, Sri Lanka's uh, oil bill is about 20 percent of its total import bill. In terms of uh, forex implication, the economic context, the investment climate, the industry can have implications from a paradigm shift uh, in terms of opportunities it can offer. Uh, we have with us today Mr. Ruchit Kandage, who is a industry internationally experienced professional. He is a former member of the Petroleum Resources Development Committee, which is the apex body determining the uh, strategic direction and policy for commercializing hydrocarbon uh, resources in Sri Lanka. He is also currently the executive director of a private equity entity which specializes in healthcare, hospitality, real estate, uh, financial markets and business process outsourcing. Uh, his international experience comes from his uh, previous uh, capacity as vice president with a joint venture entity between uh, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation and Borealis which is a uh, European, renowned European petrochemical manufacturing company. Uh, thank you, Richard, for joining us today. Thank you, Sama. Uh, so, to start off proceedings, Richard, if you could just take us through the timeline which uh, Sri Lanka's uh, oil and gas industry experienced in terms of discovery and moving forward uh, historically. Uh, yeah, if you go back to the starting of the oil uh, process and oil exploration activities, it started somewhere in 1957 58 was started by a Canadian company who came into Sri Lanka to do a, a magnetic gravity survey, airborne magnetic gravity survey of our country. And since then, for the last uh, so many years, almost about 60 years of the country's history on the exploration activities, we have seen a uh, lot of companies, a lot of key players also coming into the picture and uh, basically what they have done is they have captured about 35,000 line kilometers of uh, 2D seismic data and they also have captured about four to 5,000 square kilometers of 3D seismic data and uh, then we also have done few stratigraphic wells, we also have done few exploratory wells and uh, then we also have undergone a few uh, uh, bidding rounds and where we have initially successfully marketed two bids in the Kauri Basin C2 and C3 for Bonavista Energy of Singapore. Then during the last bidding round, we have uh, been able to get hold of Keynes Lanka to come into Keynes, International Keynes, uh, Keynes of India to come to Sri Lanka and carry out the exploration activities. And uh, since lately, uh, maybe from the 2015 onwards or so, we have been focusing more on the strategic direction of the industry and to see how we can successfully market what we currently have developed, that's the M2 block, and to see how we can monetize and get the resources required for our country's future. And in that context, what we have done is we have already started looking at the developing the infrastructure and the softer skills required to nourish the industry. We've gone in, looked into a petroleum bill, that's a petroleum act, which is currently with the Attorney General's Department to, for their views. And then we also have looked into the current geographical uh, uh, setup and as well as the countries who are participating in this petroleum exploration mm -hmm. activities. We have done a benchmark study. We have developed a world-class petroleum resource agreement. That's an, another plus point which is internationally accepted. And then we also have started marketing the M2 block. So these are the current uh, things and where I should not fail to uh, emphasize is two or three very critical things which is happening at the moment. One, Total, which is the fourth largest oil and gas company in the world, has entered into a joint study agreement with Sri Lanka on the Ceylon Basin on the East Coast. And we also have roped in Slumberger, which is the largest oil service company in the world. 
to do a multi-client seismic data acquisition program right across the island. And that's, I think, two other things which I should mention, which we have achieved during the past 18 months or so. Right. So, Ruchit, if I ask you with regards to the prospects itself in terms of discovery, in terms of timelines, in terms of the uh, upstream oil industry, what can we expect uh, from this point onwards? Uh, if you look into the historically, we, we believe that we have one of the best uh, hydrocarbon systems in the world. and. Uh, which is a fact when you go out to the world and discuss with different people who are much who are much aware of the situation they would say that your country is country has a, a robust geophysical structures and has a robust petroleum system in place and you would be you would consider we would consider you to be a next generation oil and gas producer in the world and they also going to say that there is a significant windfalls which will accrue to our country because of that. So that's the international understanding what we have. It's not from just small uh, companies or countries. These are much bigger Western countries as well as much bigger multinationals and international oil and gas companies. So that's the prospect from the wider uh, global angle. Then secondly, if you look at our country, we are, go back millions of years, we believe we were part of the African continent. And then we left there to come to where we are now. But when our country, Sri Lanka, when she left that, she didn't come empty handed, I believe it very much. And she came with abundance of resources, specifically in the hydrocarbon sector. And, uh, and also if you go back into the East African countries where we believe she came from earlier, specifically Mozambique, Mozambique has one of the largest discoveries made in the recent past of about 100 trillion cubic feet of gas. That's right. a, the, one of the largest. And then the players who are involved in that, Anadarko, Shell, Exxon, Mobil, they are also interested in our hydrocarbon resources and the exploration activities. So that is uh, another one, the prospects that you talk of. Then thirdly, look at our M2 block which is one of, the more, uh, one of the blocks available currently for people to invest and the investors to be there. And it is very rich in data. And based on the exploration activities and the data and the analysis what they carried out, we believe very strongly it has 300 billion cubic feet of gas with a probability of 90% or so with upside of about 1.8 trillion TCF of gas, which is a significant find. So these are the prospects we believe that our country has. Right. So I mean, if we just put that again, uh, just to summarize, I mean, looking at the players who are involved and the opportunity that considering that the possibility of being broken from the African bloc itself does offer significant attention and opportunity as an industry for the country going forward. I think if we put yeah. it that way, it's, it's going to be correct. Yeah, and we have proven reserves of that and that's a probability of 90% is very high. That's fantastic, yeah. that's fantastic. Uh, when we look at the industry integration itself between the upstream industry and then look at the downstream integration as well as looking at the industry as a whole in terms of integrating the entire value system, what sort of, I mean, how ready are we, what, what kind of requirements exist and what kind of potential opportunities are there? Uh, the, the integration of downstream and up, upstream and the downstream industry structure is more or less a, a, a strategy which we have put forward during the last marketing uh, of M2 block. The other issue is we require roughly about 1.8 billion to 2 billion dollars of money to invest in the exploration activities in order to monetize the resources what we have in M2 block. Now, currently to attract that much of money is very difficult in the oil market. One, there's a glut of oil and then the, the second thing is the demand forecasts are very, uh, very low and it's going down. Thirdly, there's a significant, abundance, a significant amount and abundance of oil inventories and given that the, the headwinds for oil prices to creep up is very, very low. And so therefore we live in an economy where lower for longer oil prices will exist. Secondly, the gas industry, the same thing, there's excess of gas till about 2025 and beyond. So in such difficult circumstances to attract 
a large amount of investments which we require is very difficult. So therefore we had to look at more creative ways how we can attract this investment in order to monetize our country's resources. Then when you go into the world, you see that it's not only us, India has gas, Bangladesh has petroleum resources, Pakistan has, Myanmar has and all these things. So, so then they are all competing for a limited capital expenditure of the multinationals and the exploration companies which is there. So what is the uniqueness of us to attract? So that's one thing which we have lacked in the past where that's why we may have not been able to attract the larger players. So this time we made a concentrated effort where we say yes you have the upstream opportunities as well as the downstream opportunities. Upstream opportunities if you look at the exploration activities they are high risk but highly rewarding. Downstream activities they are also highly rewarding but the risks are much lower. So if you look at the whole value chain you see that the opportunity exists for us to align our risks and the rewards, meaning align our, in the sense, the international companies and the investors, risks and rewards along the value chain mm -hmm. by opening up the downstream industry structures pertaining to chemicals, right. to petrochemicals, transportation, power and such. So therefore, we have created this strategy saying, yes, come invest with us, but we are open not only for the upstream, but also for the downstream industry structure. Therefore, you can get the whole value chain open up for your investments. It has more benefits for us also because by opening it up and attracting investments for our downstream industry, we can build long-term sustainable competitive advantages by combining our uniqueness pertaining to the feedstock advantage to the geographical, strategic geographical uh, structures what we have. We are close to two of the largest markets in the world or free, have free, uh, free trade agreements with them or nearly completed. This will allow us as a country to develop this hydrocarbon sector which will also have sustainable competitive advantage in the long term. So that is why we have gone into linking up the upstream, downstream and allowing them to re uh, align their risks and rewards along the value creation process. I think that's an important point which you bring across the unique selling points and leveraging the competencies and resources that you possess to build a sustainable competitive advantage. I think that, that is an important point considering that there's a large number of players competing for a limited uh, share of the pie basically. Yes, exactly. That's the process then that that's the idea and that's the strategic advantage we will have in the long term. Uh, when we look at the industry, the stakeholders play a fairly significant role. How much of interest is there from serious players to, to invest in Sri Lanka? I mean, we would have seen something in the past, Cairns was a name you mentioned. Going forward, leveraging, I mean, the strategies which you have created, uh, who are the serious players which we can expect and has there been any interest uh, already? Yes, uh, during the March of this year, there was a team from Sri Lanka, including myself, we went to Houston and we were having discussions with the key players in the oil and gas exploration industry, from uh, starting from Woodside, Shell, uh, Conoco, uh, Statoil, Anadarko and many of these international and multinational companies, including the governments of certain countries. Now, when, when we meet them and when we discuss our potential, specifically pertaining to M2, and we allow, give them this new strategy of upstream, downstream and alignment, there has been a significant amount of interest from them. So much so, these companies are willing to participate and pay $50,000 to $100,000 to purchase our data packs and to start for, do further studies and to come up with uh, proposals for the government. Yeah. So they are, so there's that much of interest. At least we have received a keen interest in write, written interest from nine key players who I mentioned to you now. And there are a few more which I can't, I, I can't remember now, but these were the people whom we had the discussions and who were really keen to pursue coming to Sri Lanka and investing in our exploration activities. Not only that, but also the downstream opportunities.
Right. Uh, I think uh, the next problem, probably the important question is from an economic perspective, how much does Sri Lanka stand to gain and can we quantify some of the positive uh, factors which the industry can uh, bring across if the opportunities are actually capitalized on? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, I will tell a few titles of jobs, it's just uh, geophysicist, geoscientist, uh, roughneck, uh, mud engineer, or reservoir engineer, HSE advisor, EU planner, PE planner, uh, economist, and uh, probably uh, 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 another uh, uh, production engineers and others. These are not the titles of jobs which we have heard in our country. And these are skill, semi skill, and type of jobs and these employment opportunities are available because we are going to have it in a have it have it in the hydrocarbon industry and so these jobs which are highly skilled and also they are benchmarked internationally because a, a, a reservoir engineer in Sri Lanka would be most almost compatible with the reservoir engineer in India or in US or in Middle East so therefore you have a, a high skilled job which is international benchmark with international mobility being offered to Sri Lanka. So I am only talking of the hydrocarbon industry but you ha I also said that there is a downstream industry structure and there also is another cluster of industries which will develop around this like say for example supply chain you need to bring most of the drill bits and other things and store it in a place. You need heavy equipment to be leased, you need helicopters to fly out to the offshore drilling rigs, you need transportation where small boats and other things, you need insurance, you need financing, you need uh, health safety environment things, you need training. So you can imagine the cluster of industries which will build around it which is not available for our Sri Lankans at the moment and which is internationally benchmarked and in with international mobility. This is one of the biggest things what we will see, large employment creation opportunities in large numbers, that is one. The second thing is, I also said that we have three basins in our country. One is a Mana Basin, we have nine blocks there. We have Kauri Basin, we have six blocks there. We have on the east coast, that is the joint study or we call the Ceylon Basin, we have another number of seven blocks there. Now out of that there is one Mana Basin, if you put the whole thing together, we believe that there is about 10 billion barrels of oil in place with a potential gas reserves or gas in place of about 7 to 10 TCF or even more. So if I put the current oil price is around say 50 dollars right? and then we have 10 billion barrels that will give you about 500 billion dollars of oil in place. I am saying we are those are not recoverable but that is there. Now we take a guess and say we discount it by 50 percent. So we have now 250 billion so we have de-risked it with a probability of maybe 50 to 60 percent or more of achieving this value. Now you have that much of things. Then since we are going with an investor who is a multinational or another country, we may get about 50 percent of that or more than say 50 percent of that is a government share. So we are talking of about 125 billion dollars. This is the amount of money which is available for us. Before we go into this monetizing of hydrocarbon resources, we also need to think that people need to come here, they need to do the exploration activities. So therefore, if you look at the MANA Basin, M2 block, if you were to monetize our capital expenditure there over a period of 20 years would be roughly about 1.8 billion dollars. And out of that 75 percent would be spent within the first three years or four years. So that is significant amount of cash flow would in, uh, accrue to the Sri Lankan government whereby we will be able to elevate our issues with the balance of payment. That is the second thing. And thirdly, we always talk in our country of a debt trap and we have excessive debts which we need to serve. Now I said we have about 125 billion dollars of reserves which can we can bring into our country's balance sheet. Now when you have that much of assets within our country, you can say and you can approach the international community, international financial community and say look we have this much of assets in our balance sheet which is possible and proven reserves. Would it be possible for you to securitize at least 10 percent of that 
and give us that money up front. So where will our country's debt situation would be? So these are the few things, employment opportunities, balance of payment issues, immediate solution. Third, the possibility of getting out of this debt trap are all linked into one industry. And this is where our country should really, really concentrate on and say, yes, there's an opportunity, there's a significant interest from the international community to come on board to Sri Lanka and to explore these opportunities. There are significant opportunities for us to enter into the downstream industries which are with our resource base and build a sustainable competitive industry in the hydrocarbons which we never have had. So, so the question is with the country and with the people whether do we want to take that step and go towards the right direction so that we can help our children. Maybe it takes such a long time, maybe not in my lifetime but probably in uh, our children or their grandchildren and great grandchildren's times, we will be able to create something and say yes we did this under our watch for our country. Fantastic. So there we have it, the opportunities of the oil and gas industry to Sri Lanka as a country in terms of an economic factor, in terms of getting out of a debt trap, the foreign exchange and so much more benefits if we can uh, realize the potential that the industry does have to offer. Uh, we thank you for joining us for another episode and do join us next week for another episode of Market Watch. Thank you, Richard, for joining thank us. Thank you very much, Osama. Thank you.